I want you to know that I'm going to be doing my absolute best to make this video digestible. It's sometimes hard to work with and be obsessed with something for years and then just tap somebody on the shoulder and be like, yo, did you know that you could like literally reprogram your brain and treat mental illness and epilepsy and migraines and then control music with your thoughts and increase intelligence? And I have to start by telling you that under no circumstances should you do anything related to neurofeedback yourself without first consulting with and establishing a baseline under the supervision of a psychologist and or neurologist. So chapters, I want to tell you why musicians are smarter than non musicians seriously i want to tell you what music does to the human brain and i also want to find out which instrument makes me the most relaxed and focused then we're going to take a sharp turn and i'm going to tell you about how i treated my own anxiety and depression using something called neurofeedback and then we can talk about how generative music and neurofeedback work wonderfully together in comparison to what's being offered clinically. It's a pretty deep rabbit hole, but like I said, it's a digestible one. Let's go. Believe me, I know it feels utterly ridiculous to say a blanket statement like musicians are smarter than non-musicians, especially given the reputation musicians have for doing stupid and reckless things. But there have been a lot of studies into the correlation between musicians and intelligence, and they all suggest the same thing. One of many examples, a study in 2011 showed that musicians were significantly better at tasks with visual inputs like puzzles or sorting objects. They had significantly increased reading comprehension and the ability to remember more words, resulting in an intrinsically preponderant vocabulary. And this actually shouldn't be that surprising. Okay, I'm playing a C major. That's C, E, and G. Let's make it a C major seventh, which adds a B, or a ninth, which adds a D. So C, E, G, B, D. Oh, now rhythm. How about in three fourths, like a waltz? So that's counting to three instead of four. One, two, three, one, two, three. Now let's change the chord to a D major ninth. So that's D, F sharp, A, C sharp, E. Or minor, or D, seven, nine. All this logic and planning and ordered sequencing, and I somehow have remembered which fingers to use for every single note, how long to hold it, how hard to press it. The left hemisphere of my brain is lighting up. But now I want to feel something. I want to describe a beautiful place to you that might also be a little mysterious. Now we've all but abandoned the grasp of classical music rules, and it still makes sense somehow, and the right hemisphere of my brain is lighting up and shooting billions of signals back and forth with the left. My math skills and motor skills and memories and impulses and emotions and intuition and imagination are all fucking one another at the same time. Wow, that was a pretty unique neurological workout we just had. And if you're not a musician, I have some great news for you. In 2020, the COVID lockdowns led to a whole bunch of people picking up new hobbies. And in one particular study, they gave over 4,700 participants an IQ test before they started this new hobby. Some chose knitting, painting, coding, a new exercise, but a whole bunch of them learned how to play a new instrument. And on average, after only six months, the beginner's musician's IQs had raised by over 10 points, while some of the other hobbies had even lost a few points. So if you needed an extra push to pick up and learn a musical instrument, that is a great one. And this is something that the majority of my viewers could do today, as you should, because it's one of the most rewarding experiences I could imagine. About six years ago, I obtained my first ever electroencephalogram machine, which is also commonly referred to as EEG. It was an open source kit that I built and I got it working, and I quickly realized that trying to find useful data when reading electrical activity in the human brain is very difficult, to say the least. It's borderline impossible if you're trying to find useful data from yourself because you need your brain to monitor your brain. So initially, I had to rely on friends volunteering to let me hook up electrodes to their skull while books like this helped me understand what I was looking at. To be a little bit more technically transparent, this led me to figuring out my baseline with a MATLAB toolbox and creating a sort of bend a computer interface with Python using libraries like the coincidentally named PyBrain for filtering. And there is a lot of filtering. The biggest challenge when it comes to EEG data is filtering out the abundance of noise. Anyway, so when I initially dove into all of this, it was for a very personal reason, to treat my 
own anxiety and depression. And I believe that I did that rather effectively. And this sounds like some hokey metaphysical alternative medicine thing, but it's very real and it's been used successfully to treat everything from epilepsy to Alzheimer's. You know what? Let's just zoom into a baby's brain. Newborn babies are complete idiots. Their synapses are few and far between and there aren't too many neural connections in there. Their emotional spectrum is limited to attraction and withdrawal, but that changes quickly. After only two months, infants begin engaging socially by smiling. By nine months, we have laughter, joy, sadness, anger. By two years of age, most children have reached singularity and become self-aware. They realize that they are separate from others, and this allows them to feel things like guilt and sympathy. And wow, look at those synapses. Unfortunately, that's about as good as it gets. The rest of your life, your synapses will decompose while your experiences will connect them to one another. And by the time we're adults, we will have over a trillion of these connections. Some of these connections are visceral, like sneezing after you've inhaled dust. And some are socially functional, like passing a cafe where you met a friend and then being reminded that their birthday is coming up. Some are unhealthy, like PTSD or phobias. But the ultimate question is, can we rewire our brains? The answer is yeah, totally. Your brain is constantly forming and abandoning new synaptic connections. So one very broad way of doing this would be by filtering your experiences. And this is more common than you might think. Someone who had just quit smoking is likely to avoid triggers for a while. And sure enough, they might be able to return to those triggers once a connection has been abandoned long enough. But there's another way to do this that is often faster. And this is where EEGs come in. If you look up neurofeedback, a lot of times you'll see headlines with words like rewiring, and I do think that's a little hyperbolic. I like to use the word guiding because this is essentially like building a Lego castle while wearing a pair of boxing gloves, except that if you make a mistake, the consequences are much worse. Which is why, again, you should have a neurologist help you find your baseline and target wavelengths, which is not an easy thing to do, by the way. It'll take weeks if you're lucky. But then there's the actual feedback part, and a lot of clinics will have you move a shape into the center of a screen, or maybe it'll play a beep when you leave your baseline, and some of the fancier ones will have like a rocket ship that you could move up and down with your mind. It's boring as shit, and I just didn't see a lot of reward in it. So initially I devised a system where I would watch MMA or boxing matches, and if I left my baseline it would pause, and I would get frustrated, and then I would have to focus and relax and get back into my baseline and then it would start playing again and then my reward center would fire off. Then I moved the pause and resume model up to a Super Nintendo emulator, which is pretty interesting because it's actually pretty frustrating to play Super Mario Brothers at times, which makes you leave your baseline even more and I think that that actually reinforces it all the better. And then naturally I involved music by making an ambient generative reactor patch that would only go into tune when I was within my baseline. And that actually worked well for a long time, and I was even able to respond to emails and things like that while wearing it and while training, which made training take up less time and be less taxing. Then in 2019, before my facial hair got all gray, I had a YouTube video on this very thing, which led to me being hired for a few different research jobs relating to this in the private sector. So it's important to point out that the objective of successful neurofeedback therapy is to not to continue the therapy beyond training, because once you've trained the feedback loop, the neural connections should keep themselves active. The reason I have a couple headsets around is because I occasionally do research in this field. And here's the reality. These sensors pick up everything, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cellular data, or just plain old anonymous radio waves in the air. They require gel or saline or adhesive. They require calibration. Then for example, one of the sensors will dry up. You'll have to take the entire thing off. You'll have to remove all of the felt from the sensors, soak them in saline. Then you'll have to recalibrate the whole thing only to have a problem with another if the resistance between them is off. They get interference from movement. And I don't mean like doing somersaults movement. I mean like moving your eyebrows or smiling by blinking from you looking at things. And I guess you get what you pay for in effort because every helmet that I've had, the easier it is to use, the less accurate or useful it is. So again, if this is something you're interested in trying, the first step is to go to a neurofeedback clinic with actual medical doctors. You may even have insurance that covers it, but either way, it will be cheaper than ordering one of these products and gambling on it. So neurofeedback aside, when wearing an EEG, out of all of the things that I've tried, exercising, watching a movie, reading a book, 
Playing an instrument lights up my brain like nothing else. One thing I've been really curious about that has no scientific value whatsoever, what instrument makes me the happiest? So to gauge happy for the purpose of this video, it will be gauged by my usual Python algorithm, which is interpreting OSC data and then sending it to processing so we could visualize it and see what's going on. I'm going to try and quantify these meters into focus, happiness, and stress. Let's go. I was kind of expecting guitar to win since it was my childhood instrument. It did not. Apparently drums stress me out a little bit more than they make me focused or happy, or that could be interference from the movement. A keyboard or piano or electric piano is what I spend most of the time playing these days and I guess now I know why I'm so addicted to it. And then we have the ronroco, and there's something about this instrument that I felt deeply, almost spiritually connected to for the last 15 years. And surprisingly, the winner is a lesser known Latin American concert based charango. I think a lot of people, especially the kind of people who watch this channel, want a BCI or a brain control interface that allows them to create or manipulate music with their thoughts. And this totally exists and I made a little patch demonstrating it. Whenever I'm wearing an EEG and recording a video, that adds a whole bunch of pressure to things, and so it's actually a little bit harder to find my baseline, but all right, so I'm just going to wink my left eye here. And I'm gonna wink my right eye. Wonderful. I'm gonna disconnect those so they don't annoy us. So I'm gonna turn on the focus oscillator. Obviously, I'm not very focused right now. Okay, so this one up here is the happiness oscillator, and this one's actually a lot harder to do because you can't just smile and fake happiness like you would if somebody was telling you the story of how they decided to stop eating meat. You actually have to be happy. You can't fake it. And so you have to think about happy things and it takes a minute. Hopefully I'll be able to get it going 
in short amount of time. Yeah, it's not doing anything for me. No? Alright. This actually goes way higher than this. I think I'm just actually kind of stressed out today. I can't do it under pressure, damn it. So these days what I'm using is a generative music system that I've made that allows me to change things like the scale, rhythm, timbre, things like that so I don't get too bored of the song over time. And then I use emotional attenuators for the neurofeedback therapy. Unfortunately, for a video like this, it doesn't have a UI, so it's not very fun to look at. However, when I decided to make this video for some reason, I thought it would be a good idea to try and make it in Reactor so I could have a presentable user interface, and it took like 30 hours. So here. So like I mentioned, when I go into the threshold of being focused, then the music will drift into tune and it will drift out if I leave that threshold. I'm going to turn the mic off so we could hear it better. So what brought it back out of tune there was a notification on my smartwatch. Obviously, I love it, but I can understand how it might be a little new age for some people. And if you're not familiar with music writing or synths, then the preset songs would probably get boring after a while. But realistically, if we look 10 to 15 years into the future, I could see home EEG setups being more accurate and easier to get working and maybe even being mounted to a pair of headphones and then you have things like stem separation software that uses deep learning and you could just detune your favorite songs in real time. So rather than sitting in a chair listening to a generative ambient song trying to focus, whatever music you were listening to would be interactively training you to do so. I mean, that would literally be the largest advancement in the way we listen to music since the invention of the phonograph. And also, a decade into the future, as our understanding of the human brain grows, perhaps we'll be able to pinpoint more effective ways to treat and cure more neurological diseases and mental illnesses. And as somebody who has been taking an SSRI every single day for my entire adult life, a safer and more targeted treatment for mental illness is a very exciting thing to look forward to in the future. I feel like I could just keep talking about this stuff forever, and I'm not entirely sure if this is as fascinating to everybody else as it is to me, so I'll just leave it there. If you have any questions, I will keep an eye on the comments. Only one of them, though. And finally, if you want to discuss this type of stuff with a like-minded community of tech and science and music-obsessed individuals, or participate in monthly songwriting challenges, or have access to loads of music, audio assets, and even discount codes, then you can join my Patreon for as little as $1. Thanks for watching, keep creating, see you soon, bye.